we have a lot to talk about uh, today, so uh, some interesting stuff, so let's get right uh, to it. If you're taking notes uh, in your Palm Harvest app or just on some, you know, scratch paper, here's the big idea for our conversation today, and this is good news, brothers and sisters, for you and me, and that is that God offers his mercy to rebels. God offers his mercy to rebels. In fact, I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, you are a rebel. You are a rebel, Kelly. You're a rebel. Uh, you are a rebel, and that's good news for you and me, because one of the things we're going to talk about today, and I want you to specifically look for these words, the word mercy and the word rebel in our scriptures, because it says here that God offers his mercy to rebels. And so if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Romans chapter 11. Now, we're making our way through the book of Romans. Believe it or not, we're almost done. We've got a few more uh, weeks left in it. And uh, Romans chapter 11 in the, in the book of Romans, in the Bible, is, it's an interesting book. It's really a, uh, it's probably, you could probably teach a college class uh, on Romans chapter 11 because it has this uh, really deep historical lesson to it. But we're going to skip for, for today's conversation. I want to pick, sort of give you the overview of what we're going to talk about. And, uh, and really, um, let me just begin with this. Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, he's one of the early church leaders, uh, early Christians, early followers of Jesus. Remember, he's writing to these Christians, both uh, Jewish and Gentile, people who are followers of Christ. And one of the things that uh, Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 11 as he begins this with this historical lesson to talk about Abraham who was if you many of you probably are familiar if you go all the way back to the Bible following the days of Noah and the boat and the flood there's a guy by the name of Abraham who had this relationship with God and God says My, Abraham I like you I'm going to bless you and I'm going to really bless your, your, your family tree, your lineage with, for generations uh, and by making you into, the, into a great nation, which we know is the nation of what? Israel today, right? Well, what Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 11, which has super ab much application for you and me today, is he says, the Jewish people, as we're going to see here in a minute, they, they got reckless, they, they started to take for granted this, this blessing. I mean, everything that they touched sort of turned to gold, if you will. And, and all of a sudden, they started to take for granted this, this, this blessing that God had, had given to, upon them. And what they, what they developed was this I'm better than you attitude. Have you ever known anybody who's got an I'm better than you attitude? You know, next Friday uh, here in Costa Mesa, over here at Jim Scott Stadium, there's going to be a football game that goes on between the Estancia Eagles and the Costa Mesa Mustangs. It's called the Battle of the Bell or Battle for the Bell. And the winning team gets to ring this bell and then put this trophy in their, you know, trophy case and they get a good on Newport Rib Company for some ribs with which the, uh, you know, Jim Scott's family and so forth, you know, helps pay for. It's a, it's a big deal. But at the end of the game, whoever wins... The, there's, a, there's a whole lot of I'm better than you attitude going on. Would you agree with that? Um, now, I, I, I'm going to make a prediction as to who's going to win the game. Uh, I, uh, first of all, my assumption is, well, I know the, the, the team that's going to win is going to score the most points. <laughs> and, and I do have a hunch as to what school is, gonna, um, is probably going to win the game. So, Coach Vargas, we're, we're, we're with you. Um, but they had this better, the Jewish people had this better than, than, than you attitude. And so when Jesus arrives on the scene and he begins to sort of treat people with, with this not I'm better than you attitude, but rather this attitude of equality at every level of social and religious class, the Jewish elites, really for the most part, most of the Jewish people, they got upset by Jesus' actions. They got upset by Jesus' teaching. They got accept, they're upset with Jesus as sort of the way he treated and accepted people. And, and for that reason, many of them turned their back on them. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to think the way I think? Fine, I, I don't need you. I'm better than you, Jesus. And, and they turned their back on, on God's son. And in so doing, they suffered a tragic consequence. Do you know what, what it was? Here's the consequence of, of their decision. Paul's going to tell us here in Romans chapter 11 that as a result of their 
rejection of, of Jesus, as a result of their, I'm going to hold on to my I'm better than you attitude, God basically says, listen, if you don't want to be a conduit through which I work and extend my blessing to others, I'm blessing you not just so you can hoard it all for yourself, but I'm blessing you so that you can be a, a, you know, a giver and dispenser of my goodness to other people. Listen, Jewish people, if you don't want to be the receptor, if you don't want to be the conduit, so to speak, then I'm going to find somebody else who will do it. I've given you this stuff, not just so you can keep it to yourself. I'm giving it to you so you can spread it around. But if you don't want to spread it around, that's fine. i got a lot of different people who I can work through. And I'm going to offer my mercy and my love and my grace to what Paul's going to tell us here, to rebels better known as the Gentiles, you and me. Okay? So in Romans chapter 11, skip all the way down to verse 28, because we're going to start at the back of this book. And then we're going to kind of make our way through, through toward the beginning. So Matthew, or Romans chapter 11, verse 28, this is, this is what we read. He says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people God loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. God offers his mercy to who? To rebels. He says, now they, the Jews, are the rebels, and God's mercy has come to you so that you too will share in God's mercy. Listen, church, when the nation of Israel rejected Jesus, verse 30 says that God placed his focus upon the Gentiles. Okay, you got that big picture. Now in your Bible, turn back a few books to the book Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Okay, so go back, so it goes Romans, Acts, and then backwards, what is it? John, Luke, Mark, and then Matthew. Matthew chapter 15. And I want you to read with me a story about an encounter that Jesus had one day with a woman that might surprise you if you're not familiar with this story. His reaction, is, it's like, really, Jesus said that? Jesus did this, but it's true. So I want you to check it out. Matthew chapter 15, go down to verse 21. Matthew 15, verse 21, okay? Picture the scene in your mind, and this is what we read. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and a Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even his word. And his disciples are urging him to, urged him to send her away, tell her to go away. They said, she's bothering us with all her begging. Now let's stop here for a second. So the situation we have here is, is of this mom, and she's not Jewish, she's a Gentile mom, and she's got a daughter who's either demon-possessed, or certainly what we're told here is she's, this, this daughter is being severely tormented by this, this demon. And because this mom is desperate, and maybe moms you can relate to, to being desperate for the, the, the health and the well-being of your, your, your kids, if you have any, she goes to Jesus basically looking for him to, 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 to heal her, to deliver her. And, and, and I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but in my thinking, if anyone warranted Jesus' healing touch, it was this young girl. Would you, would you agree with that? So how does Jesus at first respond to this, this gentle, Gentile woman? What's it say? He gave her no reply. What does that suggest? He ignored her. He ignored her. I mean, and clearly that she's calling out over and over and over again because the disciples are like, would you please just tell this woman to, to leave us alone? She's bothering us. Jesus doesn't give her the time of the day. Now, that, does that surprise any of you? It does me. It seems kind of uncharacteristic of Jesus, does it not? Verse 22 again. Let's see if we can find it. So this Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon, demon that torments her severely. Verse 23. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. 
Then his disciples urged him to send her away, tell her to go away. They said, she's begging us. But then, bothering us with all her begging, verse 24. But then Jesus said to the woman, check this out. He says, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Now church, don't gloss over Jesus' response here. Jesus is basically reinforcing this belief that the Jews are better than Gentiles. Is that what Jesus is emphasizing here? He's not. It's a trick question. I think what Jesus is simply saying here is that his mission, his purpose for coming to earth was to help God's people, the Jewish nation, it wasn't, he wasn't saying that the Gentiles were important, weren't important to him. He just had his priority list. And at the top of his priority list, and many of you have priorities, he's going, I've come to help the Jewish nation get back on track because they've lost their way. And so that's why Jesus, God sent his son Jesus to earth, which is why Jesus is basically not responding to this Jesus' cry for help. As weird as that may seem, 24 again. So then Jesus said, the woman I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. I love this. Verse 25, but she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Oh man, that's tough stuff, tough stuff. But she replied, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. That's a smart woman. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great, your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. God offers his mercy to who? Rebels. Rebels. Okay, go back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Skip down to verse 13. Romans chapter 11. Verse 13. So Paul's saying this. I'm saying all of this, especially for you Gentiles. He said, God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles, and I stress this, for I want some... I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have so I might save some of them. So Paul is basically saying, listen, God has, has he's decided to move on. He's, he, he came, his intent was to come to Jews, but like Jesus with this, this Gentile mother, God's going, fine, if you don't want to be the conduit through which I'm going to work, I'm going to reach out to, to other people who have faith, people of faith, and Paul says, Even though he's a Jew, God has sent me to be a missionary to Gentiles, and that's why I've come. Verse 15. It says, For since their rejection, meaning the Jews, meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who were dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy, just as the entire batch of dough is holy, because the portion given as a whole offering is holy. Lots of big stuff here. For if the roots of the tree are holy, then the branches will be too. One more verse. This is a key one. He said, but some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off, and you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. They've been grafted in, so now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. Now, let me flesh this out for you. Do you guys all understand what grafting is? Rob, this is where, this is where you're going to come up. Okay, come on up. Rob doesn't know this. I just warned him, hey, Rob, you're going to come up and help me. So I, I want you to, is this hot here, David? All right, I might need some help. No, we need this. It's true. Okay, so, um, so first of all, I want you to know uh, Rob is um, he knows a lot about trees. In fact, you go to any amusement park in the United States and maybe internationally, Disney World, Jurassic Park. Rob's trees are in this because what do you do for a living? I sell trees. I sell trees. He sells trees. Okay, so my hunch is Rob that you probably know a little bit about 
grafting. Have you ever done grafting with a tree? Yes, I have. Okay. I took a pomology class. Okay, so what, what is, explain to us, he's, Paul, Paul's using this term grafting. What is grafting in the a, in a tree world? So uh, mostly uh, why grafting is used is because you want a um, certain look of material. You, like if you have, uh, just say some kind of flowering tree, a uh, Hong Kong orchid, okay? You, if you plant them from seeds, they might not all look the same, but if you take a, a, a cutting of them and you graft it onto some rootstock, then that top part, they'll all be the same. They'll be like uh, clones, okay? The other reason grafting is done, like on fruit trees, you'll see like especially uh, orange trees that, or, and citrus trees, you'll see like, oh, this comes up and then now it changes right there and the top is different. Right there, you'll just see a little like, oh, that looks different than the trunk, it changes right there. So the reason they do that is because Scientists figured out that, oh, this certain kind of orange, it's, it's not very tasty, but it is very, very disease resistant, or it's some kind of citrus, not to be orange, but, and so they call it root stock. And so that stock that is the root part is very resistant to disease. It might also have very um, uh, excellent roots that grow quickly and absorb a lot of nutrients. Well, you can't eat the fruit from this tree be, from this uh, particular uh, plant because it's horrible. But they found, oh man, here's this beautiful tangerine or orange or lemon, beautiful fruit, but it has lousy roots and it gets diseases. So you take the good part and you graft it on to the, the good fruiting part, you graft it onto the good root part. And you get a, so give us an example. Can you think of any, and Joe, you can jump in on this, any fruits that we currently eat that would be an example of a, a tree that's been grafted just just about any citrus that you you would eat is grafted guaranteed it's grafted almost all uh plum trees and um uh pear trees and apple trees all those fruit trees they're just all grafted none of them are from just a seed they are uh there and a lot of the rootstock is the same even though the top may be different the same rootstock for lemons and oranges and limes, it's all the same type of plant on, in, for the roots, but then the top is different. Okay, perfect. So this is, now, you have that image in mind. Thank you, Rob. I knew you, could, I knew you could hammer this down. So basically, Paul is saying, okay, we've got this rootstock, the Israeli Jewish rootstock that God has said, I'm going to bless this nation, but because they got careless, he says, now I'm going to take this, the Gentile nation, all of you, you and me, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you the opportunity through Jesus to be grafted in to this promise. And so for those of us who have given our hearts to Jesus and accepted Jesus Christ's forgiveness, not just for our sins, but the promises also that we now get to look forward to and experience the blessing, if you will, that God gave to Abraham. Are you claiming that for yourself? You know, sometimes when we face, you know, like this, we, again, we sang this song this morning, I'm gonna, I, in the sea of victory, the devil, I think, sometimes tries to overwhelm us. Not sometimes, he does, a lot. And our response would be, listen, you can't treat me like that. I'm the son of God. I'm the daughter of God. I've been grafted into his blessing. You can't treat me like that. You can't treat my son like that. You can't treat my daughter like that. You can't treat my friend like that because I'm a conduit through which God is going to bless people. And so, friends, when you leave here today, you should kind of leave with your shoulders back and your head high, not with the sense that I'm better than you, but to understand that you are God's hands and feet, right? We talk about that. You may be the only Jesus some people will ever come in contact with. And it's not because you're better than them, because we're all rebels. It's just that we've been received God's mercy and his grace and his love, and we get the opportunity with some, well, I don't know what you would call it, attitude, some Jesus attitude, you're not going to walk over me like this because I'm the son of God. So devil, get behind me. You know, and so friends, when you're, when you're praying for your kids, and many of you are parents, you know, and our kids are our kids. They're making the same goofy decisions that we made when we were their ages. And sometimes things don't go well. Sometimes the wheels fall off a little bit. We, you just claim it. 
and go, I'm not giving up my son or daughter because she's a child of God, amen? Because she's been grafted in and she or he's been grafted in because I've been grafted in. Why? Because God has mercy on the rebels. But what Paul, I want you to notice though, what Paul warns the Gentiles, what he warns you and me of, even though we've been grafted in, he gives us a warning. Look at verse 18, Romans chapter 11, verse 18. He said, you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just the branch, not the root. Rob, your analogy was perfect. The root stock, I love it. He says, well, you may say those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, Paul says. But remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe, he says, verse 22. He is severe toward those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you in to his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. So what's the Apostle Paul saying here? He's basically saying if God is willing to cut off the Jew, then he will just as easily cut off the Gentile. If he's willing to cut off the original branch, don't you think he'll, spare, he'll, he'll cut off the graft if, if we fall out of line? Sobering stuff, okay? Last set of verses. Go back to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. And this is where we're going to camp for the remaining few minutes. Matthew 24. And this is where my mind has been for the last several months, and especially this week. Matthew chapter 24, I want you to look at verse four. Now Jesus is about to go to the cross and he's starting to tell his disciples about what to expect. He's talking about the future, which brothers and sisters, we're getting closer to this, closer to this I think, all the time. And it, I'll explain why here. Verse 24, verse four. So Jesus told them, <clears throat> Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claim I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. So Jesus is talking about the end of time when he comes back and judgment day comes. Nation will go to war against nation and the kingdoms against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Verse 9. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will go cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. Skip down to verse 23. Then if anyone tells you, look, here's the Messiah or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I've warned you about this ahead of time. Skip down to verse 30. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming, verse 30, will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will, check this, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Friends, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be obvious. How are we going to know it? Because it's going to be in the sky. It's going to be like this aerial presentation. 
I'm going to give you an example here in a second. But keep that in truth. Okay, verse 42. No, wait, where am I at? Great glory, verse 30, 31. My eyes are getting bad. I can't see anymore. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Let's go a couple more verses. Go down to verse 36, and we'll end this here. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. And that is the way it will be when the sun comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom his master can give the responsibility of managing other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all that he owns. But what if the master is evil and thinks, huh, my master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, what the Apostle Paul is reinforcing here in Romans chapter 11, that as Gentiles, he is saying we are fortunate to have the opportunity to be saved. He is saying, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to be grafted into God's promise, into the root trees, the root stock, as Rob articulately expressed, through Jesus. But Paul warns us, as he did, as Jesus did in here in Matthew 24, to not get complacent, but rather be prepared. You know, if there's one thing that this COVID-19 has reinforced for me personally, if there's one thing that this mask-wearing, social distancing, vaccination mandate has showcased for me personally, it's, I think it's given me a glimpse. It's given you a glimpse into what the end times are going to look like. Friends, there will likely be a day when we can't travel when we can't get on an airplane unless we satisfy a specific list of regulations. Do you believe that? Do you think that time's coming? And so there will likely be a day when we can't shop and buy groceries unless we can sport a certain list of credentials. Because you can't have sick people come in here. You can't have rebels come in here, so you gotta have your have your card. It's just real easy. All you have to do is fill out this form, get a couple shots, dress a certain way, then we know who's in and who's out. And there will be a day, there will likely be a day when I will be arrested for preaching about Jesus Christ, about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's happening around the world. Are we think that it won't happen here in the United States? When you and I preach about Jesus' love for people like you and me, we will be arrested. Jesus said it. Now, that's not a reason for you or me to be fearful. Certainly, I don't feel that fear. I might might feel scared in the moment. But it is a reason for us to be prepared. It is a reason for us to be on our guard. God offers his mercy to rebels, to sinners like you and me. That's the good news of the Bible, amen? 
But the message of the Bible also reminds us that the clock is ticking and that Jesus' return and his judgment is coming. So don't get complacent. I'll close with this. This past week, I got a text message from Yumi Patterson. You guys don't know who Yumi is? She coaches the cheerleaders over at Sunset High School and she's part of a church. And she said, Mike, have you seen the video? Have you seen this video that everybody's watching is going viral? And she included this link to this YouTube. And I watched this video and basically... Two weeks ago, on March 27th, at the Western Wall, which is the remaining wall of the Temple Mount, some people call it the Wailing Wall, it's where the Jewish nation, people from all around the world will travel to, to pray, because that's the closest remaining remnant where it was closest to where the Holy of Holies was. On March 27th, on Passover weekend, the Jewish rabbis, some of the, the most prominent, highest rabbis in the land, men who represent hundreds of millions of people, really, were declaring that their Jewish Messiah has arrived. His name is something Ben David, which means the son of David. And he was, they were kissing his hands, illustrating that they have They've given their, their, their support of him. He's part Jewish and he's part Muslim. Have you seen this video? Friends, he's not Jesus. They're saying that he's the promised Messiah. He's the son of David that has finally come. He's 30 years old. Praying at the Western Wall kissing their hands and mobs of people just mobs and mobs people are just running to him get a glimpse of him and touch him our Messiah has come he's not the Messiah because we read here that when Jesus returns it's going to be for all the world to be seen so don't be misled don't be misled so if you've never prayed and I know many of you have to ask God to forgive your sins and to fill your life with peace not fear then I urge you to do so before it's too late. And if you know somebody who is living their life apart from God if you don't maybe you don't know how to talk to them about Jesus you know what you and I can do for them? We can pray for them. Because if we've given our heart to Jesus, we have been grafted into that blessing and we need to claim that blessing for those who we're concerned about. We need to pray diligently for them, asking God to graft them in to the living tree of life. Yes? So here's how we're going to close today. We're going to pray three different prayers, okay? So get comfortable. Put everything down. I often will just open my hands open like this because it's just a position of receptivity. Like, God, okay, I need you to come. I want you to work. Even when I drive, was driving here today, you know, my Lord, speak through me today. I want to be your vessel. I want you to first and foremost pray for yourself, okay? Just ask God to forgive you again. If you're fearful about your future, just say, God, I'm really kind of scared. I got concerns about my own health and my own well-being. Or Just pray. Just offer that to him. And invite him to, to, to help you to be not just alert, which is important, but to just to have his peace as we move forward today and in the days to come. So pray for yourself. Now I want you to pray for somebody who you know who's wandered away from Jesus. It could be a son, it could be a daughter, it could be a friend, it could be an ex. It could be a parent. Just picture their face in your mind if you can. And you know they, they at one point they loved Jesus. They were raised maybe in a home. But now life has grabbed them. And they've, they've wandered off the path. Would you pray for them? Would you ask God in his mercy for rebels to bring them back? Draw them back, God. 
please. I'm, I'm petitioning you as your son or daughter to draw them back, to graft them into the tree. Just by name, call them out in your, in your mind. I'm calling them out. I'm claiming them, Jesus, for you. And now I want you to pray lastly for someone who has yet to invite Jesus into their life. It could be a parent. It could be a neighbor. It could be a coworker. Somebody who you know who... has not yet been grafted in. Could be your mechanic, your dentist, your chiropractor. Who do you know? All right, all eyes up here. Amen. Hands up. Band, come on up. Let me give you a final blessing. You guys ready? If you have given your heart to Jesus, friends, live in the reality that you have been grafted in and you are blessed and your seed is blessed. The same promise that God made to Abraham is your promise to declare for your life and my life. So receive it and live in it and claim it. And today as you go out and you encounter people at, in your neighborhood and at the store and at wherever you might be, recognize that when you just say hello to people, it's as if Jesus is saying hello. So be his hands and feet this week. Let his peace funnel through you to them. Will you receive it? I receive it. And I bless you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Why don't we stand and sing?